Mr. So Merz is like Agatha Christie on speed. <laughs> We're in midsummer now, and things happen differently here. The deaths are unusual and fascinating. Who in their right mind chooses to be surrounded by death? Midsummer Murders is one of the most popular crime dramas, not just in Britain, but on the planet. Monsieur Molloy, merci de tout cœur. The French version is quite my favourite. Over the next hour, we'll celebrate 25 years of the strangest goings on. I love the human handle, which was particularly amazing to just see on set. Reveal the show's dark secrets. I believe I've killed 18 people, and I'm still at large. Bring curious insights. He said, I'm not going to blink. And I went, wow. And look back at the world-famous stars... I will drive straight over you. ..who dared take their first TV steps in Midsummer County. It's actually quite family-friendly, despite all the murders. As we go behind the scenes on a quarter of a century of mystery... It's like I was in some kind of apocalyptic world where people just died all the time. ..and mayhem... You know, we kill people with cheese. That There isn't another programme, I think, that can do that. Have we got a murder weapon? You're standing in it. In the glorious English countryside. What's not to like about Midsummer? As long as you survive it, really. I killed him because I wanted to. Death by chocolate. No good deed goes on from this day. Here, in these deadly woodlands, filming for the latest series of Midsummer Murders has begun. Action! And Inspector Barnaby has yet another death to investigate, quite possibly the 396th Midsummer Murder. But no one really knows. They've got this beautiful scenery, and then they've got these murders, which sometimes are quite outlandish. Over the past 25 years, Audiences the world over have embraced Midsummer's reputation as the deadliest place on television. Midsummer Murders has a, a, a light feel to it in a lot of ways and, and has an awful lot of comedy within it. Of course, the public laughed at the unfeasible number of deaths and all those things. There will be at least three or four murders before Tom Barnaby found out who'd done it. You know, he's the most useless cop in the world. And <laughs> but thankfully, the Corston police are dogged and reliable, and over the years have brought us not one, but two Inspector Barnabys to keep on top of the body count. Midsummer takes everything seriously enough for us to enjoy it, but not so seriously that we can't also go, what is going on in this place? There's nothing intrinsically nasty about Midsummer anywhere, although people get murdered. They're sort of escapist deaths, fun deaths. Here we are, all celebrating the 25th anniversary of Midsummer Murders. Already enjoying the sights of Oxfordshire today, this group of Midsummer fans are about to discover the location of one of the series' most infamous murders. Here we are in Badger's Drift, otherwise known as the Lee in Buckinghamshire. And what you are looking at here is exactly where, in the opening sequence of that very first episode, you saw Emily Simpson riding her bicycle along the road. Here is where the whole story of Midsummer Murders started. 25 years ago, the fictional Midsummer village of Badger's Drift was the sleepy setting for the debut episode of a brand new crime drama. Hello, Miss Simpson. Have a very good afternoon. The killings of Badger's Drift, all the, uh, the tropes of the provincial murder drama were there. There was blackmail and knife killings and all the rest of those things. How'd she die? That's easy, broken neck. 
But the question is, did she fall? <laughs> or was she pushed? The brother and sister had been, had been caught by the Rainbirds, who were the local undertakers. And so they were blackmailing people. How much do you think it's worth? Think what the police will make of it if their forensic people get hold of it. <laughs> They'd have a field day. Oh, 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 this is the big one, Denny. This is going to make us very, very rich. <laughs> oh. The characters were wonderfully well written. They were caricatures, of course they were. But of course, the main star of this opening whodunit was the genial local detective, Inspector Barnaby. Who are you? What do you want? I'm Detective Inspector Barnaby. And this is Detective Sergeant Troy. Who are you? The producer came to see me uh, with the proposition that I should play a detective in this uh, new series he had coming up. And I thought, well, I've already done Bergerac. But it was as far away from the world of Bergerac as could possibly be. Here was a guy who was a respectably uh, married man. He had no hang-ups, no psychological difficulties of life. What's this then? It's Delia Smith. Stewed neck of lamb with mushroom dumplings. You can't go wrong with Delia Smith. Mm, that's what I've always thought. But he finds himself in a world full of extraordinary characters. Mm -hmm. Every one of the pe people he sees in the high street there is a potential murderer. And that's all. I thought that was fun. You know, Mrs. Rainbird, I'd have said that 8 o'clock was a bit late for your hobby. I mean, what are you likely to see flying at that time? Owls. I was right there from the beginning, the pilot. We went to the then producer, Brian Trume, and we said to him, so, you know, what do you think this is going well? Do you, do you think we might even get a series out of this? And he said, I've got plans for Midsummer Murders for 12 years. And we went straight to John and we said, do you want to hear something really funny? Apparently we're going to be doing this for 12 years. Why do I get the feeling that everyone is lying to me? Everyone. They always lie to you, Tom, and you always know. That's why you're so good at your job. And then I was in it for another 14 years. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. It was, uh, we got 15.8 million viewers for that first episode. It's 2.15. So I'd meet Joyce at the fate. You coming? Yeah. I thought I'd win myself a coconut. <laughs> and what inspired this series, full of strange people and plots, was a collection of acclaimed crime novels. <laughs> It was a series of books by a lovely writer called Caroline Graham. I'd read them, actually, and they were terrific. The original sort of artistic producer on it, Betty Willingale, it was clever to spot it, you know, and, and do what she did along with the first writer to make it work for television. Caroline Graham's books inspired the first five episodes, but over the next few years, a host of new writers would take Barnaby on many new adventures. We're on. But there was another key character whose role was to remain calm amongst this wicked world of murder. Dinner's ready, Tom. Believe you me, it's not easy playing the nicest woman in the world. You know, Cully's coming tomorrow. She's going to want to see a bit of you. Yeah. Just I know how you are when you get started on a case. Yes. For 14 years, it was Barnaby's wife, Joyce, whose happy home life with Tom and their daughter, Cully, was in stark contrast to the many deadly challenges they faced, including Joyce's cooking. How much meat on this chicken, is it? It's not a chicken, it's a quail. She was a terrible cook, fried wren, stuff like that, and Barnaby had to pretend to like them. Dad, I bought you a present from Cambridge. What is it? It's chicken and ham. The bad cooking lasted for a bit, but there's limits to how many lousy meals you can cook. So she became uh, more and more involved in the actual cases as time went on. It was very handy that, that Joyce didn't have a career because she could therefore have hobbies. You've caught me digging up rather too much of your lawn. Yeah, I'm still working, actually. Do you have pictures in those plant encyclopedias of yours? Yes. That was quite a handy device for writers and nice for me, you know, to not always be sitting in the kitchen, you know, being out in the world, being blown up in a canal or doing watercolour painting. That was a good one. Instead of being a kind of grace note in the great symphony of Midsummer, she became a whole theme on her own. Coming up, there's Confessions of a Midsummer Sidekick. 
When I think of my time on it, it's like I was in some kind of apocalyptic world where people just died all the time. As we celebrate a hit series that's always left us seeing stars. I'd already watched the show since the beginning and loved it, so I jumped at the chance, little thinking that I might return for a longer stay. This is the new DCI Barnaby, cousin of the other DCI Barnaby. For 25 years, Midsummer Murders has led us on a trail of death and destruction. A path which has, in turn, put many of the quaintest villages in Oxfordshire on a rather unusual tourist map. Here we are outside the estate agent that was used in an episode called House in the Woods. It was Harriet Davis' estate agency in that show. In that episode, a couple who are looking to buy the house in the woods find themselves garroted outside the house, and there the mystery begins. Over the years, fighting crime in Midsummer has been quite a task for the overworked, understaffed Corston police. And when it comes to the real legwork, the running, jumping, flirting, or going undercover, it often falls to the Midsummer sidekick, the lowly Detective Sergeant. And first in line was Detective Sergeant Gavin Troy. John and I clicked from day one, and we laughed every single day. In the books, he was a right little thug. I could force it, sir. You've broken enough rules for one day, Troy. Thank you, also. He had no charm at all and was uh, entirely not good detective material. That was changed in the, uh, in the television version. The character became, uh, I think the word is lovable. He couldn't drive a car. Wherever he went, he used to hit the hedge or hit somebody else. Or... Yeah, Troy was, was an appalling driver. But I used to love it because it meant that I could do a lot of the stunt driving that we could do. Some of it I wasn't allowed to do but a lot of it I was. Troy. But after six years on the rural beat, actor Daniel Casey decided to move on to pastures new. Thank you, sir. I mean, thank you for everything over the years. I will never forget that final scene, because we filmed that last, and when uh, Barnaby speaks to Troy, uh, it did feel very real. I know how much I've, uh, I've relied on you, Troy. Midsummer will miss you. And I'll miss Midsummer. He's a leading man in every sense of the word. He, le he, le he led that company beautifully. Troy? Now, the next psychic was uh, John Hopkins. He's a terrific actor. What have we got? Good question, sir. Victim's name's Nicholas Turner. He's a local solicitor. Took a stroll off his roof. He was a very dark and kind of brooding figure. Initial impression as to cause of death, catastrophic head and spinal injuries. It's quite a snappy dresser. Um, and then uh, Jason Hughes came in. And you are? Uh, Constable Jones, sir. Constable Jones. Yeah, I thought it was just brilliant, the way that they did it. No Scott this morning? No, he called in sick, I'm on the own. I just showed up in a uniform and somebody said, well, where's the guy? And they were, oh, he's sick. <laughs> and that was it. He was gone and I was in. <laughs> you possess a suit, Jones? Yes, sir. And a tie? I do, sir, yes. How do you fancy working with the CID for a couple of days, eh? Yes, sir. They make me do all kinds of stuff. Then none would be the standout one. I was luring a killer to then pounce on them. On your feet. Who the hell trained her? I mean, when I think of my time on it, those seven years, it's like I was in some kind of apocalyptic world where people just died all the time. I haven't been up that way for a while. Junction 2 to Junction 7 on the M40, I, I just divert, just go somewhere else. <clears throat> Start to get kind of hot flushes and, you know, memories of murder. 
Well, there's plenty of that around, but one of the key questions in any episode of Midsummer is not just who done it, but more like who's in it. How wonderful! <sighs> but no. I was once suspected of murder myself. Apart from the person who killed him, I was probably the last person to see him. Because across the past 25 years, the series has played host to a who's who of the British acting profession. We get fantastic guests. Over the years, it's just the entire range of the British acting profession. I took an order earlier, three-tiered Dungeons and Dragons in white and dark chocolate. As an actor, I always think Midsummer Murders, it's one of those boxes that has to be ticked. What was brilliant about my character is that she was the suspected murderer for pretty much the whole episode. Do you really think I would kill Dominic and keep the weapon? I mean, do you honestly believe that I would be that stupid? The twist was she actually wasn't the murderer. That was ideal for me. And there was one TV comedy national treasure who set the wheels in motion for guest stars to come. An early one was uh, Richard Breyer's legend. In Death's Shadow, from 1998, the star of The Good Life was playing the village priest and called the midwife's Judy Parfit his wife. I have a police inspector coming to see me. Oh, don't tell me, Stephen. You've been found with your hand in the steeple fund. Don't be ridiculous. He came along to play a priest and he was wonderfully enthusiastic. Yes, we got, looks as if we're going to have the weather for it. Absolutely. Did you manage to find someone to open the faith? A celebrity? No, not yet, but I may have had an idea. I'll be back forthwith. We were sitting, waiting to go into the church where there was going to be the big scene, the reveal, that Richard Briers, who, you know, the loveliest man in the world kind of thing, does turn out to be the bad guy. And I'm sitting with him and he says to me, I'm going to do some acting in this scene. And I went, are you Richard? <laughs> yes. He said, I'm not going to blink. And I went, Wow, and that's exactly what he did. It was terrifying. Stephen Wentworth, we're arresting you for the murders of Richard Bailey, David Whiteley, and Simon Fletcher. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defense if you do not mention one question, something which you later rely on in court. Who was he? No planning, no calculation. He had to die by your hand before his operation. And it was all the more shocking because it was Richard Briers, because you didn't expect it. Please come in. It was lovely, but a casting. Many a famous face has popped up in Midsummer Murders, but the cast list also includes some now well known names who weren't quite so familiar at the time. Edward, what was all the noise about? It was a police car. Police car? In 2009, the Corston police were called to investigate the very strange death of a young man in Midsummer's miniature village. What they found was future Oscar-winning actress Olivia Colman playing the unlikely suspect, Bernice. The police have found a body here in the village. A body? Oh, Edward, that's terrible. She wasn't a huge star then. She just has a kind of truthfulness as an actor. I was just gobsmacked. She had that extraordinary ability of being 100% within the part. I just know you're going to win. I'll be cheering for you all the way. Oh, for God's sake, leave me alone, will you? She just can't step an emotional foot wrong. I don't think she could do it if she tried. She didn't like me putting flowers on the graves. She smashed them. So I smashed her. The green grass grows all around, all around, and the green grass grows all around. I'm not in the least surprised that she's gone on to be a great lady of English acting. Not at all surprised. But amongst a cast of more than a thousand actors over 23 series, there have been some surprises. You still seeing that girl? I wonder what she'd say. She knew about me. Get lost, Laura. I used to do mentoring at the Guildhall School, and one of my mentees was Orlando Bloom. And the minute I met him, I knew he was going to be a movie star. And so I read the current script, and I thought, well, Orlando could do that so easily. So I put his name forward to the casting director, and there you go. You're Peter Drinkwater, and you're police. It's the same smell. You can always tell. And then he went on to be an elf, and there you are. 
<laughs> and Midsummer was the starting point for another British movie star, spotted here by Harry Potter's David Bradley, who's worked with a fair few budding actors himself. Nice day for it, young man. It was my last episode, and there was this young boy, really handsome, and uh, he was quite a gentle soul, really nice guy. I just thought, I hope he doesn't get eaten up and spat out by this business. I will drive straight over you. Henry Cavill went on to do rather well for himself. Unfortunately for the future star of Superman, Henry's Kryptonian powers weren't quite developed enough to save him from death by Midsummer. But there was one fleeting appearance that would blossom into something far more long-term. Excuse me. Neil actually had appeared in Midsummer Murders in a fairly early series, I think, playing a gardener. <coughs> he spent a lot of time in the hothouse being quizzed and being generally suspicious. Where are you going? Back to the garden. I'm a gardener, remember? A particularly randy gardener um, who flirted with Joyce Barnaby, much to Tom's irritation. Brought you a few Pennington gems. Oh, that's very kind of you, Daniel. Bear in mind the white bedder is vigorous. I think that was the only time anybody flirted with Joyce Barnaby. I'd be quite happy to come back and make sure everything's nicely bedded in. That was a fun day's filming. Right. Well, uh, I'll be off then. I'd already watched the show since the beginning and loved it. So when my agent rang up and said, oh, do you want to do you know, off to you an episode of Midsummer?" I said, oh, that'd be fantastic, that'd be brilliant. So I jumped at the chance, little thinking that um, I might return for a longer stay. It was nine years later when the moment finally came for DCI Tom Barnaby and actor John Nettles to retire from this hot spot of murder and mayhem. It was 13 years, a long, long time. I was getting off 70 and I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't think of any more reactions to dead bodies, to be honest with you. I couldn't. So are we saying it's suspicious? Well, the question is, was she dead before immersion? There's no obvious signs of struggle. I'll know more when I've opened her up, Tom. Tom? Sir? Ah, yeah. Well, I suppose I better get changed. When John decided to retire, uh, we started quite a long process of uh, quite a long list of uh, potential potential replacements. After two years, it was finally decided that Neil Dudgeon was the man for the job. Oh, it's John. Oh, John! He was on everybody's shortlist. This isn't personal, is it, Tom? No, no, no. This is preventative detection. OK, I'll uh, dig a little deeper. But there was something of an unusual hurdle for anyone replacing Inspector Tom Barnaby. In Britain, Midsummer Murders is known as Midsummer Murders, whereas in a lot of territories around the world, it's called Barnaby or Inspector Barnaby. So somebody came up with the idea that Tom Barnaby, John Nettle's character, has a cousin who's also a police detective chief inspector, and his name, of course, being his cousin, is John Barnaby. That was miraculous. <laughs> yeah, he was a cousin who had come from Cousin Land. This is the new DCI Barnaby, cousin of the other DCI Barnaby. Oh. And I certainly didn't think, oh, I want to go to Midsummer and change anything. I would go to Midsummer and do what John was doing. It was brilliant. It's a great show. You're the local. You take it. My first scene as, as John Barnaby once John had left and I'd kind of moved in, it was in this sort of pathology lab. And then all these people came into this little room and they're all having a look going, can he do it? Is he going to be all right? Is this OK? Or are we all going to be looking for another job next week? But somehow we have to encompass this little news item. Palmer was never keen on driving the Lotus X4 because, being a left-hander, he found the positioning of the gear lever more awkward than usual. See, right-handed headshot, easy peasy, bang as per your photos. But as a lefty, damn near impossible. Conclusion? Precisely. See you later. But the real test would come when we saw the new Inspector Barnaby on TV along with his wife, Sarah, and dog, Sykes. 
When we first took over, there was lots of talk of there being sort of big shoes to fill. I think for fans, there was a mixed reaction, I think, at the beginning. Mr Barnaby, Mrs Barnaby. I was certainly concerned, but actually the reception was very warm. I hope Sykes didn't disgrace himself. Oh, he did make some amorous advances towards two of my bitches, which wasn't the best of starts. But I think from Sykes's point of view, it was top banana. <sighs> Consider him part of the pack. Oh, fantastic news, thank you. I get people who sort of see me in the street and go, oh, yeah, you're the new Mrs Barnaby, aren't you? And you think, I've, I've been doing it for 10 years. How long do I need to do it? Here we are 10, 12 years later. It's, um, we're still here talking about it. So, fingers crossed. Coming up, how Midsummer Murders went on to make a killing around the world. It's just great in French. And Midsummer's greatest mystery is finally solved. A lot of people think it's the same village we keep going to. They look at you and then they say, there can't be anybody left alive in that village. Oxfordshire town of Tame, a place that has featured regularly as the fictional town of Corston, a Midsummer Murders guided tour is in full swing. Here we are at um, Corston Town Hall, the centre of Midsummer County. Of course, it's not really Corston. We are actually outside Thames Town Hall, as you can see. Indeed, one of the key attractions of Midsummer Murders is its quintessentially English chocolate box setting. The countryside's very important, I think. When I used to watch it before I was in the show, I'd be on the sofa with my wife and you'd have this opening shot of some beautiful village and a Norman church and lovely thatched cottages. And we were all sort of intrigued as to, where did they film that? It's so beautiful. And I still kind of, I find myself in a beautiful village like this and I say, where are we exactly? Yep. Midsummer is, well, it's along the M4, M40 corridor, usually west. It's Hertfordshire, it's Oxfordshire, it's Buckinghamshire, anywhere the script demands. Hear that, dear viewers? A script. Because Midsummer, home of the National Collection of Rural Murders, is, we must remind you, a completely fictional place. I don't know how many times I've had to sort of explain that to people who've got this little village and all these murders. They look at you first, they set it up as a gag, and then they say, there can't be anybody left alive in that village. But it's cheap to buy a house. A lot of people think it's the same village we keep going to, but it's not. We make up the names, got to hammer that home, it's not. It's not a village. It's a county, everybody, not a village. It is a huge English county made up of beautiful villages. Uh, and made up of people who, who are insane and <laughs> want to kill people. <laughs> Suddenly there was a rather weighty object in my hand and, well, what can I say? She stepped out in front of it. Let's put Solomon Gorge on the psycho map! Are you ready? Are you ready? Two. Over 25 years, Midsummer County, not village, has delivered an impressive number of murders nearly 400 at the last count, with ever-imaginative new ways to tax the Corston police. Well, I think what's genius about it is that it manages to marry together all of the components of your Agatha Christie, Marjorie Allingham, you know, all the greats of the golden age of whodunits in England, while being nominally contemporary. This is the essential contradiction. All these beautiful look-at-me villages, the half-timbered cottages and so forth. All this is subverted, of course, in Midsummer Murders, because your dear old lady is a homicidal maniac. All human life is there. That chocolate box image is frayed slightly in Midsummer. I always say that if Jesus had played a sport, I'm sure it would have been cricket. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at beautiful cottages and gardens while fetishism is going on in the background. Behold, I was shapen in wickedness. People just like to see, especially to my way of thinking, this is all so beautiful, isn't it? This is all lovely. Oh, my goodness, that man's been eaten by a wild boar. Most of his chest and stomach are gone. 
Not to get too technical about it, I'd say he's been eaten by something. That sort of contrast of one with the other, I think, is, is sort of rich and appealing to us in some human way. It might seem like the most British of TV dramas, but you might be surprised to hear that Midsummer is exceptionally well travelled. Señor Mark Adler, empresario, posee este lugar y a los leones de Causton. ¿Quién lo encontró? Debbie Gallagher trabaja aquí. The international appeal of Midsummer is something that a lot of people don't know about. Las puertas tenían un candado, cortaron la cadena. Quien quiera que haya sido condujo hasta aquí. It's massive in Scandinavia, it's huge in Europe, and Australia and New Zealand love it, and it's now in America. And when I signed up to the job, I didn't know that. Es mejor que perseguirlo en una cancha de squash. Yeah, I got recognized on my honeymoon in Vietnam, of all places. And I was just like, wow, this is crazy. Monsieur Molloy, merci de tout cœur. John Kinsella. <laughs> It's just great in French. Because the man voicing me, he had the most beautiful voice in the world. And he made Tom Barnaby sound like the most kind, loving man God ever put breath into. Et sans aucun doute, pas le meilleur d'entre nous. Entre. Vice-Politikommissaire, Birgitte Paulsen. Denmark is one of the countries that has been a great supporter of Midsummer. When we got to the 100th episode of Midsummer, as a kind of celebration and a sort of a thank you to the international audience, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of setting part of the 100th episode in Denmark. We were in Copenhagen with some lovely actors who I'd only just stopped watching in The Killing. Everything here tallies with the crime scene at the Calder's factory, which means he was killed in Midsummer. And that makes him your problem. Anne Eleanor Jorgenstein, she played the mother in The Killing, and she said, they say, what are you doing next? She said, I'm, I'm doing an episode of Midsummer Murders. They go, you're doing an episode of Midsummer Murders? That's fantastic. She said they just go bonkers for anything to do with Midsummer Murders in Denmark. We're treated incredibly well. The name Midsummer of Barnaby opened doors you would not believe. We were allowed to film outside the Royal Palace. We filmed inside Copenhagen's police headquarters. And we had a fantastic couple of weeks in Denmark and uh, I think made for a very good episode. You're sneaky. That impresses me. Well, I'm glad you're impressed. <laughs> Coming up, Midsummer's greatest murderer is finally unmasked. I believe I've killed 18 people, and I'm still at large. And how Midsummer dines out on the most savoury of deaths. <laughs> has found a unique place in television history, not just because it's been killing people off for 25 years, or the volume of deaths it manages to squeeze into each episode. No, it's the way they kill them that's really caught our imagination. The great joy about Missile Murders, one of them, is that uh, for the slightest reason, people will kill. What, what are you doing? I was just... <laughs> she fell. They don't have to have a great motive. Very short tempers. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to upset in the upper cart down there, mate. Just wanted to shut him up. And the bowling machine was right there. There are many favourite odd ways that people have found to kill other people. It's not your sort of urban murdery thing where. Oh, it's some sort of drug-addled mugging goes wrong. They're sort of escapist deaths, fun deaths. Over 22 series, the pressure to deliver ever more outlandish deaths has proved a grisly challenge for the writers and set designers. I love the human candle, which was particularly amazing to just see on set, actually, the way that they made this sort of entire wax body. The human Roman candle one of Nero's favourite ways to kill naughty Christians. My favourite deaths in the show. There are so many to choose from over the years. There was an episode called The Dark Rider. It opened, there was a storm over this castle. In the storm, he looks down and sees a, a headless horseman.
And I love it when I'm reading an episode and think, how are we going to sort of justify he and we have seen a headless horseman? Eye holes, but no current occupant. And fans on our tourist trail are about to discover the location of one of Midsummer's most infamous crimes. Everything in this village centres around one thing, the dairy. So this is the beautiful, picturesque village of Turville, which has been used frequently not only in Midsummer Murders, but in the Vicar of Dibley and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. In fact, you can see at the top of the hill the very windmill that was used in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And, of course, also in Schooled in Murder, the episode uh, where it particularly featured in Midsummer Murders. The cheese one is the one that everyone absolutely loves. Hello! People are forever saying, oh, the one with Martin McCutcheon. What are you playing at? Because I'm not in the mood for games. Not today. Crushed by wheels of cheese. Brilliant. And I think that's really sort of clever. Have we got a murder weapon? You're standing in it. We kill people with cheese. That There isn't another programme, I think, that can do that. I mean, the writers, whoever are thinking up all of these murders, how they keep going, finding new ones, I'll never know. Picking a murder out of the air is amazing. I spend most of the year sending texts to myself saying, this would be a great murder, or oh, this would be an even better one. Over the past eight years, writer Jeff Povey has come up with some of Midsummer's most talked about deaths. Hooking in some deadly fishing. The man in the vat of worms, he was killed and then dragged into the tackle shop. But the actor was amazing. He said, yeah, I'll get in there and they can crawl over me if they want. Creepy comic book capers and a somewhat gruesome adventure in the art world. I had one where he was drowned in paint. You know what they say, Nelson? In art, everything has a deeper meaning. I think the process for a spectacular death is basically, what is your world? What are you doing here? Come to tell me how great I am. When I did the cricket one, I knew for a fact that they had these bowling machines that hurled the balls down. <laughs> And I thought, well, what if you were tied up and you couldn't move and there's 100 balls going 100 miles an hour? It's bound to kill you, isn't it? And then we talked to, like, a medical person. They said, oh, it just takes one to hit them on the heart and it'll stop it or whatever, you know, and you go, OK. That's probably one of my favourite ones because I thought it's very sort of visual and you could feel it. You can really feel that. And I just think the writerly imagination, you sometimes think, oh, Get help. Where has this come from? What's wrong with you? There's a few good deaths in the next one that's filming at the moment. Camera set and action! As soon as you get this message, grab Etta and get to the shelter. Including this latest episode, I believe I've killed 18 people. And I'm still at large. Prior to his demise, he called two numbers. It's a terrible thing to say, but it's, it's great fun killing people. It really is. <laughs> But come every Midsummer murder, often the first person at the death scene is not a police officer. Looks like she was immersed in this stuff when it was in liquid form. For Cam, I think one of her favourite murders possibly was the incident at Cooper Hill with the aliens and the spaceships because she couldn't solve it. So you're saying this stuff's alien? I'm saying it's alien for me. For her, that was probably fun. For the actors, that was probably not fun because they had to be put into black bags covered in black goo. I used to be very protective over the murdered actors just because they had to hold really uncomfortable positions for long periods of time. I would just make sure there's a pillow or they could just lean on something. In 2016, Manjinder Verk became the fourth actor to take on the busy role of Midsummer Pathologist. The first day on set, it was quite surreal. Please, call me Cam. There was something familiar about being with Neil. It was part of my growing up. Don't suppose there's much you can tell from an empty room, is there? Quite the opposite. Right. 
I took the job on because I liked the character and I thought she was interesting. See this, the weft of the carpet? It's flattened in the same way. I didn't realise that um, it would be part of a sort of controversial headline because I was the first person of colour as a regular on the show. It's important to have this discussion. And the thing about Midsummers is it's so out there as a show, it's important to realise that people from all walks of life can be represented. So, how are you finding the job? It's not what I was expecting so far, but I'm enjoying the challenge. Cheers. 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 Across the years, the Midsummer pathologists have had one of the most gruesome jobs on television, and not just because of the criminally shapeless boiler suits. Fleur came into the series peering into a vat of beer. Boiled human flesh isn't something I work with every day, so I'll need to consult a specialist. And possibly a cookbook. I believe there have been five pathologists. Um, Barry Jackson played the first pathologist, of course. So where is it then, the body? Most of it's in the hall. And I know of late, um, uh, they have been often the love interest for the sidekick. Do you remember when they took us to watch a post-mortem and the big Scottish guy fainted? <laughs> you and I had to take him outside. And then you suggested we go across the road for sushi and he nearly fainted again. He didn't know what he was missing. <laughs> but Fleur came in and she was not that. Sorry I'm late. I was removing a chainsaw from a chest cavity. She's a force of nature. She always knows best. She's always sort of solving the crimes for us. Um, and we sort of are scared of her love her, need her. Fleur has wonderful backstories. Um, she's part of a female biker gang. She's been married in Las Vegas. It's bringing back memories of my first wedding. I didn't know you'd been married. <sighs> I've been down the aisle a few times. Although it wasn't an aisle as such in Vegas. So Neil and I spend most episodes pulling looks of just going, what? What's that? It's your nice stick. With modifications. They use it in Kendo. I won shacked up with a local champion. She's some girl. <laughs> Enrobed. That's how they describe it, isn't it? On the box. Mind you, they're usually talking about a hazelnut. My very favourite murder to explore was death by chocolate. I won't be able to get stuff out of his windpipe until I get him back to the lab. It'll be all the way into his lungs, I shouldn't wonder. Pathologists traditionally are shown to be rather sort of ghoulish, dark-humoured people. I'd say he died because he got turned into a human lolly. I think humour is very important. It's a light-hearted show, really. You know, we're not line of duty. That's the point of Midsummer. is it's, it's the other end of that spectrum. The comedy element, I think, is a very important part of the tone. Mm. Mr. Burke. <sighs> it's what helps it to be cosy rather than scary. It's not that we are glib. You have to worry about someone who's been killed and then be humorous to survive yourself. Now buzz off. Let me get back to work. Barnaby stays very, very sane and true and straight through it. Mrs Dagmar, I'm here on official police business. Oh. In that case, I'm all ears, all eyes, and all the rest of me. He never jokes about victims, never, ever. Winter can, and he could get admonished for it, um, Fleur can, because she does, she, she jokes about everything. Well, that's the last time I go to a gym. You go to the gym? Yep. But as long as Barnaby doesn't succumb to it, we're on safe ground. Do you believe her? Well, it all sounds plausible enough, but something just doesn't feel right. I say this with some pride. Years ago, there was some sort of survey among police as to what was the most accurate representation of the police. All right. I give up. Why did you cross the road? Like I said, it's my day off. And Midsummer, you'll be astonished to hear this. Midsummer was adjudged the least accurate representation of actual police work. Well, I was amazed. Which I think is probably another part of its charm. We're not trying to be real. It's a made-up land. You know, these stories are fantastical, and we're not going to apologise for it. And I think that's probably something that people enjoy, because they're like, well, at least they're honest. They're not trying to be anything, you know, that they're not. Cheers. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
And this is where our tour of Midsummer County ends, exactly where it began here in Badger's Drift, 25 years after that very first episode. And so I hope that you've enjoyed our little tour today. Thank you very much. This is actually my 25th year as well. I started filming in 1997. To be honest, it's as fresh today as it was then. The storylines are uh, what we're working on at the moment. It's extraordinary. The killer reconfigured the venting system. 25 years. It's kind of incredible that any show could have within it the seeds of its own reinvention so much that it can keep changing. There's no reason for it ever to stop, as far as I can see. When you look at the, the rest of the TV landscape, it's really, um, it's really astonishing. Are you retiring? Me? I never gave you that idea. Well, you did, sort of. All those pictures of quaint cottages. Retire? I'm in my prime winter. <laughs> I just want people to carry on loving midsummer as, as I do. Happy birth in midsummer. Happy quarter century midsummer murders. Many, many happy returns. So many years, so many deaths. So many criminals caught. Well done. And the most popular crime drama on the planet has a brand new case for DCI Barnaby and DS Winter to solve next tonight in New Midsummer Murders.